The story that we hear this morning is written by someone whom tradition says is a physician by profession. And so we hear this story of healing. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewers, Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them, but when he was from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Have a seat. Well, some of you may be thinking to yourselves this morning, Gee, I know they switch up the worship service times a little bit for the summer, but I had no idea they were going to turn back the clock a full three years. It was three years ago that I served here as the foster pastor until a permanent pastor was called. Back then it was my job and it was certainly my privilege to love you and serve you as the Holy Spirit ultimately brought you Pastor Chris as Ascension's next lead pastor. And next Sunday, Pastor Chris will officially be installed in that role, all in God's time, all according to God's plan for goodness in this place. But on this Sunday, Pastor Frank's last Sunday as lead pastor here at Ascension, my assignment is to talk about healing, the healing power of the Holy Spirit, and I think how fitting because there are probably many hearts in this place today that have begun to ache a little bit or ache a lot as all of these transitions unfold and as this marvelous ministry enters a new and next phase. So it's right that we talk about healing, the kind of healing that we hear about in today's gospel lesson. And let me start by saying this first and right from the beginning, the good news of Jesus Christ for us on this day is that you need not be present to win. I don't know how many of you have ever bought a raffle ticket for, you know, and if you look at it, if you look closely at the fine print, oftentimes it will say, you must be present to win. And so you've got to be there. You've got to be there in some designated space or place at a specific time, or you don't stand a chance of getting the goodies that they are giving away at that moment. But I am here to proclaim to you this morning that it is not so with Jesus, that with Jesus you need not be present to win. The seriously sick slave, in the story we heard about today, he's healed, he's made better, he's made well again, without ever physically coming face to face in contact with the one who does the healing. Jesus never gets to the house where the ill man is, but he doesn't need to get inside. This flesh and blood Jesus doesn't need to stand directly in some specific space or place in order for one to be made whole or well again. And that really is good news for us and for the church and for the whole world. 
in this story, we're assured that the once real live person of Jesus, even though he's gone from this planet, the power of that incarnated love of God, that it persists through the Holy Spirit of Christ, that it lives and he lives. And because he does the healing power, his authority, that doesn't and can't stay dead either. And it's not found in some yellowing scrapbook which memorializes it all the while keeping us longing for that, for the days when Jesus was with us for real, when he truly walked in the midst of us. But his authority, his ability to heal, his love, his forgiveness, it's present here and now in this place. So I have to confess that the desire to be in the physical place with Jesus is a compelling one. Last fall, when a group of Ascensionite pilgrims went to the Holy Land, I was blessed to be counted among them. And one of the things that drove me to participate in that trip was this deep desire to actually stand in the places where Jesus stood. You know, I wanted to pray in the garden where he had prayed, and I wanted to rest in the shade of those 2,000-year-old olive trees, knowing that perhaps Jesus might have leaned up against one of them for rest as well. I wanted to gather with my friends in that upper room and praise God in the same way that Jesus congregated there with his. I wanted to be washed in the waters that he calmed um, when a storm blew through or where the holy sod descended on Jesus like a dove. I wanted to be there. I wanted to be in the space where Jesus was, to breathe the same air and to shake the same dust off my sandals and to look up at the moon and the stars from the same angle from which he did and to be reminded that this Jesus who is written about in these ancient scrolls had truly once been a human being with us among us this one who reconciles and redeems the whole of God's creation I wanted to meet him somehow in that space in that place so perhaps some of you have heard the story of my Sea of Galilee experience. Pastor Frank referred to it in one of his sermons, one of the sermons he preached when we got back, and so he emailed me to say that he was going to be mentioning that story. So I went to watch the sermon online to see him about that moment of nearness to Jesus on the Sea of Galilee and what happened to me when I had it. So let's see, I'm trying to recall what were the eloquent words that Pastor Frank used to describe that moment? Was it, she wept as her Savior also wept? No. Was it, she was brought to tears? Why, no. Or was it even, she was overcome with emotion? No, no, I'm remembering now. The words he used in his sermon were blubbered, she, she blubbered, <laughs> and you know what? The words were not necessarily pretty, but they were, um, they were accurate. I blubbered, I admit it, there on the Sea of Galilee. I had come 6,000 miles, traveled 13 hours by air, most spent sitting next to a stranger who was really inebriated the whole time, but that's another sermon. But I had this experience only to realize that the same Jesus who had called disciples 2,000 years ago to follow him, to get in a boat with him on the Sea of Galilee, to leave their ordinary lives behind and come with him, these for whom Jesus calmed the storms of their lives when they rose up, Jesus really is already and still doing all of those things in our lives for me for you here and now through this holy spirit so we don't have to go after him we don't have to chase him halfway across the world because he comes to us and he comes to us in real and present ways through this holy spirit of his you know i love how martin luther described faith he said it is a living busy active mighty thing Faith in this power of Jesus who sends to us as the living word of God that still speaks to us in the same way. As the incarnate word of God 
that comes to us through acts of grace and dignity in this very human experience that we share as the sacramental word, forgiveness and fortitude for the journey that comes to us in this bread and wine we're about to share, as the creational word that comes to us in the breathtaking beauty of this planet, and also as this healing word that is making us whole here and now in ways that are palpable and ongoing, this living, busy, active, mighty thing. So that's the point of this story. That's the power of this story, the faith of this one soldier whose slave is healed, even though the suffering one never comes in contact with Jesus in a direct physical. Even so, he experiences the healing presence of Christ through that spirit, assuring us that the authority of Christ is effective in every time and every place. And it's not limited to proximity or physical touch. It's not a fond memory of what Jesus did way back then in the good old days, but in the presence of Christ as it makes and sustains the church now, in the presence of Christ who here and now brings healing into the world in ways that we can't do on our own, in the presence of Christ who restores and reconciles the whole world connecting us one to each other, in the presence of Christ who makes the grace of God known through us and even to those who are yet to know Jesus. And in the presence of Christ, which, like it or not, prepares us to trust a future, even a future that is still holding, a future that we are not yet permitted to see fully. And that faith, the kind of faith that the good soldier has in the authority of Jesus, in Jesus' rule over things that we can't understand, when Jesus hears the expression of that faith, he's amazed, we're told. That's the word. He marvels. Now, people in the Bible are amazed at Jesus all the time. You know, when he raised the little girl from the dead, people were amazed. When he calmed the storm, the disciples were amazed. When he cast out demons, when the mute were able to speak again, when the blind could see and the lame could walk, all were amazed, the Bible said. But the faith of this one man this good soldier amazes Jesus, and it is the only time in the Gospels that we hear Jesus is ever amazed in a positive way. Other than that, Jesus had only been amazed at the lack of... But here, Jesus is amazed by this man who offers care and concern across social barriers, about this man who is excited to be doing the work of God, about this man who is humble, and deems himself unworthy in the presence of Christ. About this man who is willing to trust in what Christ can and will do by Christ's authority. This man who even more than that, we're told, loves our people and it is he who built a synagogue for us. A good soldier a man of amazing faith. He loves all people, and he builds for them a place of worship, a place where God is made known through preaching and teaching, a place where folks gather as the God to sing the songs and tell the stories and proclaim the truth of God's love, a place where people's gifts are blessed and multiplied, a place from which they are sent to care for the poor and tend to the sick, to speak forgiveness and to embody that grace. This man whose faith amazes Jesus, he builds for God's people a place of worship, a place where God is praised and glorified. So Pastor Frank, on your final day as lead pastor in this place, we also witness to an amazing faith, and we give thanks as well for the one among us who has built for us a place of worship, a place where God is praised and glorified. I mean, talking about this beautiful physical structure of ascension, which grew under your guidance, this butterfly that found its wing under your watchful eye. 
but also you have built for us places of worship within us, in our hearts, in our beings, in the places in our lives where you have proclaimed Christ's authority, his healing presence, his peace, his power, his purpose for our lives, his love for us, his love made known in us and through us by this same Holy Spirit. You have built for us a place of worship, a place where God is praised and glorified in the baptizing of our babies, in feeding us at Christ's table, in writing down the songs of your heart and teaching us to sing along with you, in growing and confirming the faith children, in marrying us one to another, in blessing the gifts we offer, in holding us in prayer, sometimes them next to us in the hospital beds, around our kitchen tables, in those private moments of your own prayer when you lift us up into the almighty hands of God, when you stay awake in the middle of the night on our behalf worrying, when you rejoice with our joys and share our sorrows, when you blubber as we blubber, and in the commending of our most beloved one to God's eternal care. And at least for one of us, in your standing here in this place as she officially began her ministry as an ordained pastor in this Church of Christ. And so while your physical presence among us begins to shift now in ways that are really palpable for us, ways that selfishly kind of hurt our hearts, the power of Christ that connects us remains unchanged. It persists as that living, busy, active, mighty thing that has been nurtured and emboldened by an amazing faith by a good soldier and his partner who together have built for us a place of worship, a place in our hearts where God is praised and glorified at all times and in every place. And for that, Pastor Frank, we too marvel and we are forever grateful. Amen.